I'm Andy Woolmer. I'm chief executive of a company called New Change FX. And we produce independent mid rates in foreign exchange. So we are trying to solve uh, the issue of um, fragmentation in the foreign exchange market. Uh, the principal problem of foreign exchange is that everybody gets made a price that is different and varies. So this part of the event is about where, what's the link between crypto and the real world of fiat money. That's what we're going to look at. So um, my assumption here is that you're generally not foreign exchange people. Please just, no, apart from you. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to just sort of begin by having a look at the foreign exchange market. I mean, it's basically the world's largest market in anything. So, I mean, if we look at market capitalizations of cryptocurrencies, they are dwarfed by the $5.2 trillion that gets transferred around the world on a daily basis. So that will be occurring to you as a massive opportunity, one would hope, and um, quite a daunting task to try to solve how this might fit together. About 75% of the volume that is traded is for delivery, so it's actual transactions. I think there's a general perception that the market is speculative in its nature. It really isn't. Um, most of it is for people buying and selling things, uh, requirements on accounts and so on and so forth, about 25% being for speculation. There we go. So uh, here I've just broken the market into its components because I think it's kind of key that we understand what we're talking about as you know, the bits and bobs that are actually being used by people. So we start with credit. So the first question for anybody is, can the other side of this transaction actually settle its deal? Do they have the money on account or somewhere, or is the bank giving credit? Is that, that is the first step to actually accessing the market. Generally speaking, for speculation, you put up a very small amount of, uh, essentially, you're just covering the risk of loss on a transaction. But for delivery, of course, somebody has to be sure that the full amount of the delivery is actually somewhere sitting in an account that can be claimed by somebody in the event that it's needed. Generally speaking, and this is something that, you know, that one of the biggest hurdles is that mostly those relationships are bilateral. So that means one institution facing one bank. That's probably something like 75 or 80 percent of all relationships. Bigger institutions obviously can have relationships with several banks, um, but you know this limiting factor to market access is absolutely key here. Um, some use prime brokerage, so you'll have heard about hedge funds who are obviously in the speculative bucket using uh, prime brokerage as a means of access to the market, and that means that they get much better pricing, they can ac access far more uh, prices at any one time, and it is, for them, competitive. But where you've got a bilateral relationship, you've got a problem. The next component is settlement, so we've got to make sure that um, uh, the right money ends up in the right account at the right time, and that's obviously pretty crucial because that's how people go bust. I think REFCO um, would occur to some people in the audience as being a problem. Um, uh, there was a very famous bank in the 1970s called Herstadt Bank. Uh, they managed to fall over halfway through a bunch of settlements. And so people who had sent their money to Herstadt Bank found that they didn't receive any dollars back or whatever it was. So that risk is the most serious risk in the market. This, this, the potential loss of capital through a foreign exchange deal is crucial. Um, then what does the market actually do? Well, it performs a search function. Um, essentially, the idea is that a buyer and a seller will eventually meet. If you think about the point at the beginning, which is that 75% of this flow is for settlement, then a buyer and a seller are, through the market mechanism, actually meeting at some point. And what you want to do is make that chain as short as you possibly can. Generally speaking, people will face a bank somewhere in the middle, so a bank can say, okay, I can balance the books here, I can supply the yen that this person needs and that'll be fine. And then of course we've got the price element, which is, should be formed through the process of people buying and selling and demand reflecting the price. So as we've seen in uh, Euro sterling in the last, uh, since Brexit, uh, sorry, in cable since Brexit, not as much demand for sterling. 
who knows why. Um, the next element is, um, that all sounds simple enough, right? I mean, there's a bunch of pieces of a jigsaw, so you just need to put them all together, right? So, you know, it should be fairly easy. The key bottleneck, actually, this slide could just say bank. Um, the, 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 the principal problem you've got is that the actual buyer and the actual seller neither know each other nor trust each other. So this should be ringing some crypto-type bells at the moment. Um, so banks intermediate the process, and they are crucial to the process as it stands at the moment. They understand the, the client that they have. They understand the collateral that that client is putting into the system. They understand the credit risk of offering that client the ability to access the market. Um, Generally speaking, as I said before, because they're supplying the credit, they're also in a position to supply the price. So they kind of end up controlling both of the crucial elements of access to the market. The next bottleneck is settlement. Um, I mean, this is one that goes round and round, and we'll talk about this a little bit for, in, in a couple of slides time, but it is currently two days for spot transactions. Now, obviously, um, a lot of the transactions that are done, and probably half of that $5.2 trillion is for swaps. So people putting hedges out to forward dates. So it isn't a market where instant settlement exists, particularly at the moment. And there's, there, there are some good reasons for that. Why is it a bottleneck? Well, it's an incredibly profitable business. I mean, if you think about most banks, there'll be about 20% of their bottom line will be from foreign exchange. You think about the people involved in foreign exchange, it's probably about 1% of the staff. I mean, it's an incredibly profitable, straightforward, almost riskless. I mean, it's relatively low risk. If you understand your clients, you understand your collateral, you're in a position to actually you know, trade by getting cover prices from the market before you've got a risk. And you know, generally speaking, this is pretty successful for banks. So, I mean, the other key bottleneck is fairly obviously that the banks aren't about to turn around and say, marvelous, let's uh, all help the, the crypto community to solve these problems. So, th what are these cost inefficiencies and what are they actually uh, costing a customer? Well, it, probably the easiest thing here is to um, refer to an article that Eva, who was just inter interviewing Colin, uh, wrote yes in yesterday's FT, um, and its title, if you want to look it up, is Banks Accused of Overcharging Small Customers for Forex Services. Um, it's related to an ECB paper which will be out in the next couple of weeks, and that paper basically says if you are a small client, and I think by that they mean a bilateral client, somebody who isn't prime broked or doesn't have 10 banking relationships that they can call on, you're paying about 25 times more for your foreign exchange than somebody who is in the position of uh, having those efficiencies at their, at, their, at their fingertips. What are the costs? Well, I mean, you're charged in spread in foreign exchange, and the big problem for our business is convincing people that they're being charged anything at all. I mean, it's one of the most irritating things in the world that people still refer to foreign exchange as a free service. Well, it isn't. Um, 20% of the bottom line of a bank would tend to indicate that there's a lot of money being made somewhere and it isn't by the client. Remember, it's not speculation, right? Nobody's doing anything. That we're, we're simply charging a spread over the, the cover price of the market and crystallizing that as P&L. So essentially, riskless, free money. Um, the, what does the spread reflect? Well, there's elements of the spread that are absolutely fair. I mean, you're being provided with credit. Uh, credit is not free. The bank is, to some extent, taking market risk on the transaction. I mean, they could screw it up and uh, end up with a capital loss themselves. I mean, in, a day, in the days of electronic trading, less so. I mean, in the days when I started trading in Everything was on phones and bits of paper and everyone shouting. It happened all the time, of course. Um, and then, of course, the post-trade processing. So there are a lot of people involved in back offices to make sure that things actually operate. It could also potentially reflect a degree of overcharging, which is you know, essentially what Eva discovered in that article. I mean, it's, uh, if you're paying 25 times more than you should, 
you'd think you're getting a bad deal. I think we can all agree on that. Um, we see the same thing uh, with pension fund clients. We quite often find clients who are paying $2,000 for a million dollars of transactions. Uh, the, the, the sharp end of the market is paying two. So the multiples are possibly even bigger than 25 times. So there's a real question here about what, what can um, crypto do. So let's have a look at that. So what are the key steps? Well, taking the, taking the process in order, um, obviously with pre-trade and credit, so understanding you know, that piece that the bank performs, understanding a client's balance sheet, and understanding the collateral that sits in an account is crucial. Now, crypto can easily sit in there as a process for uh, understanding what that is and then publishing that to a market. Now, you can see where this sort of leads. I mean, fairly quickly, you get to a point where, let's say you're Google and you're sitting there with $136 billion. I'm not gonna mention Facebook today. Um, then you might have a desire to put that money to work in, in this kind of credit market. But that credit market is owned by the banks. Okay, that is their bread and butter. So crypto can act as an element here uh, to instantly quantify and make that credit available uh, for people to lend against. So if you're looking for credit in the market, you don't want to start leveraging the assets you've got, but you've got good credit, that can be seen through a crypto transaction and made available to somebody who is willing to short term, i.e. two days, lend the money. That, that seems to us to be a very, very clear and useful uh, application for uh, cryptocurrencies. Settlement process? Well, certainly. Um, you know, the instant nature of a transaction sort of means that there's, a, there's a, um, an ability to move balances across a common account uh, so you've got to have the same bank uh, instantaneously, and that could change the, uh, the way the world works. We have to bear in mind, of course, we're talking about real fiat money here with balances that exist in a banking structure that is governed by central banks. So there might be questions about this, and I'll, I'll come on to those in a second. The market search function, I think this is where a lot of attention has been focused. I don't really see it. I think that the... Um, Trying to centralize demand. I mean, essentially, this is what banks and brokers do. They try to centralize as much demand as they possibly can. So what, do, what value does crypto add here? I don't think there's a great deal that we would say in the actual market search function. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that's sort of self-evident about the Libra process that Facebook have launched is that you, you begin centralizing what should... I mean, the principal feature of this should be a decentralized network, at which point, why do you want to start centralizing and taking central credit risk on somebody like Facebook? I mean, that's just a, a different play entirely. I mean, they might end up owning the foreign exchange markets, but um, I don't think everybody would be terribly happy with the exposure to their credit. Um, and then the price function. Well, it, it kind of. Um, it, it, by solving the credit issue, you start to even out the market. So the principal problem with the, the, the credit is that Every single one of you have different credit. If you are able to put, make your credit available to one lender through a central uh, entity, you start to be able to normalize your pricing. So you don't see a 25 times or a 1,000 times worse price. You see the same price as Boeing or um, you know, some huge hedge fund. And that seems to be where the, real, the rubber hits the road for this kind of project. Because of course, if you can even up the pricing, Everybody pays less. The consequent thing, uh, the result of that is that people trade more. I think one of the things that Eva brings out in her article is that people aren't trading as much as they should, even at $5.2 trillion, because people are getting a bad deal and they know they're getting a bad deal, they don't put a, a hedges on where they could. So, you know, it's a kind of, it grows the market apart from anything else. So making this kind of step towards efficiency is, is very, very important. I've sort of touched on this a little bit. Um, instant settlement may not be the panacea that we've been thinking it was. There's a very simple reason for this, and that is that central banks have to be open in order that payments between banks are made. Very simply, if you're in Japan and you've traded with somebody in the States, the central banks are not open at the same time. 
So you have to have a gap in the payment structure. So it doesn't seem to me that immediate settlement is maybe the, the, the key thing to this. Uh, the other thing that comes up is, of course, that you know, as soon as you're trading for instant settlement, you're not trading for spot. The spot market is the liquid part of the market because it's saying we have two days in which to settle these transactions. Everybody is trading at the same time. That is where about three trillion of those $5.2 trillion get done every day. So that is a deep liquid market and people understand the price. As soon as you're not trading for spots, you're adjusting a price in the forward market. So you're using the credit markets to say the price has to be brought back to today. That is not a liquid transparent market. So you're conflating two uh, different markets and, and you've got a problem. And then of course, the very fundamental thing that I would expect maybe you guys to be thinking about fixing is how do the links between uh, the crypto and the fiat asset actually work. If we can get to this world where credit becomes normalized and turned into a market uh, by, by using crypto assets as a proxy for the real assets, then that efficiency depends on the quality of those connections. So there's probably questions for all of you here on that subject. So the conclusion is that we're trying to do something here where cryptocurrencies exist within the real world of people moving payments backwards and forwards, okay? That depends on this central bank structure. It depends on a banking infrastructure, the rails of which have been developed over many, many years that are a cornerstone of government policy. And it's really a question of how crypto makes itself relevant in that uh, equation. We think it's about uh, linking those real world balances and ensuring where possible to speed up the, the transfers securely. And by linking them to um, crypto, we can start to create these markets in credit that simply don't exist at the moment. Um, there's the certainty, I think, that the, the whole point of this is to be sure that when you've got a balance of something, that it really exists. And I think taking that step into that layer of certainty and knowing that a trade will settle also has a positive effect on the pricing in the market. And, and that's really the end goal. I mean, the, the, the whole point of all of this is to get to the point where, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. I mean, let's face it, if we're certain that our dollars are on the account, then why would we not do our foreign exchange with Boeing? You know, each dollar spends equally well. There's no difference in the dollars. There's no quality issue. You don't need to buy a dollar from Goldman Sachs. It doesn't, you know, it's not like buying a Ferrari. You just need to move the money from A to B. This, is, this should be a simple, practical function that happens on a fairly equal basis for anybody with market access. So I think our point here is that the, 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 the key step is to get, um, to equalize the market, to, to make it more democratic, and by doing that, to make the pricing much more transparent to the individual participants in the market. Now, it's, uh, I've, I've, I'm missing my final slide, <laughs> which is just a, a sort of a demonstration of our, um, our data feed. So all of our data, uh, the data that New Change produces is produced 20 times a second. It is the world's only uh, official regulated streaming spot benchmark. Uh, we're about to benchmark forward pricing as well. And if you want to have access to the data, the site is tokenhouse.dev. That's it, I'm done. Would anyone like to ask me a question? Do you see long term that crypto will, uh, as you've put, like complement uh, inter-fiat uh, forex long term, or that it will replace it completely by if I want to send money to someone in Venezuela, I use an ATM to switch euro yeah. to nano and then send the nano and then they switch it from nano to bolivars or whatever over there. Uh, what do I think? Um, I, I mean, I think the, the fruitful path is going to be looking at this as a complementary business. You know, you, uh, the 5.3 trillion a day is not going to suddenly switch to, uh, um, you know, that's just not going to happen. But if, if the crypto elements can sort out the credit elements, then you start to see that that would become the common way to do that because all of a sudden you don't need the bank and you don't need to pay that structure for it. Um, I think it's a very, I mean, I think Colin was talking about 10 years. Um, you, you know, it has to be sort of the acceptance of uh, crypto in, a, in an actual exchange is a completely different problem, I think. 
And I think it's, you know, how long is a piece of string? That could take a while. But I think that there's a direct relevance to the market as it stands today in the way that the market trades in order to start to take the, the inefficiencies out of the uh, experience. If um, banks have their 20% of their bottom line going into this and you know a lot of the inefficiency is going to be removed, is that going to cause problems for a lot of them or I, some I think, of them? I mean, the question is really whether they benefit from a, um, a credit network. Um, does it enable them to extend a market access to more people if they are part of it? I mean, I, I, I don't know. If I was running a bank today, my concern would be that, yeah, would, that's a serious dent in the bottom line. If I'm not going to be the price maker, you know, I can't just stand yeah. there recycling garbage prices any longer. Hey, that's a big hit. But, you know, I can see that equally, if, if it's normal for that to happen on a systematic basis, that starts to give an opportunity, I would, I would imagine. What do you think will trigger the, uh, a change in the market? Because if the banks, 20% uh, uh, of yeah. the, their revenue uh, comes yeah, why from would they change? Yeah. the fees, it's a little bit uh, counterintuitive. And it's a very closed market, very di yeah. difficult to a new player. Yeah, I mean, we've seen, it, it, we've seen it in the, there's a Euro money survey and it came out last week. And there's a company called XTX, which is a non-bank market maker. And they have topped every category in that survey for the first time. So that's the first time a non-bank has actually done well. Um, or do, well, they've always done well, but now they're at the top of that list. So they, you, you can see that the price function is already moving away from the banks. The key is to create something that the banks can't stop. If you've got assets and they're held in a bank and that they're visible through an open API into uh, some sort of function where they're secured against a crypto, then the bank's involvement is, you know, is just dissolved. So if you're able to then have a credit marketplace and you can then access, let's say, the XTX price, that means the credit component, which is dependent on your own assets, and the, execute, the price component i.e. The, the search and price pieces, are done without a bank. And at that stage, you know, banks don't have much choice in the matter. I mean, the most important thing is to build things that don't require the permission of somebody who is absolutely, their self-interest relies on the status quo. You know, we're trying to change things. Don't ask anyone's permission to change it. So, I don't know. I mean, it, it, I said the improbable dream at the start of it. it. It could possibly be a step too far to go, but I think this is the path that we can see opening up, and this is the opportunity uh, in foreign exchange. This is the direction it should go. Nano is deliberately a very simple protocol that does one thing. Why did you join Nano as a group as opposed to joining Ripple and work on XRipple? Uh, are you asking me to talk about Ripple? Um, I'm, I, I'm, I, I, say, I I'm the, saying I'm not quite seeing yet how Nano fits into this because it's too simple to perform all these functions so well, in the absence of smart contracts. From my instance. perspective, um, something like Ripple just re represents an enormous... It's the same as the Facebook protocol, right? Y you can't achieve what you want to achieve by centralizing big components of the market, particularly with Ripple, which is owned by essentially three people. I mean, that's a phenomenal credit risk, I would have imagined, if you were to look at it, you know, um, objectively. Um, and it's these kind of questions. Now, Nano doesn't have those issues. It's not owned by anybody in particular. Decentralized network, which is along the lines of exactly what we're meant to be saying and doing in this area, um, as opposed to directly profiting from either mining or whatever. I don't, you know, from a technical standpoint, that's, that's not my uh, area of expertise at all. But I can see that a clean, clear, non-mined, non-centrally owned structure can act in a way that other coins simply can't. Thank you. Thank you.